Well, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling disorientated. I um, had troubles finding my seat after being up before because I couldn't remember where I was sitting. And um, it's not just that that I'm feeling disoriented. The seat change Sunday, everybody looks different. Everyone's in a different location. Thanks for doing that, by the way. I know it's like it's a bit silly, it's a bit quirky, but it's actually kind of nice. So thanks for changing seats. Um, that's not the only reason I'm feeling disorientated. Perhaps a greater reason is I went and saw my optometrist and they said, what job do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. And I said, well, how do you find it? They looked at my eyes and said, how do you find it when you're giving a talk? And I said, well, actually, you know, I'm always up and down and up and down. I look in the distance and I read my notes and I'm up and down. And so she recommended bifocals. And I took the punt and I'm now wearing my new bifocals. So if you see me spinning around and falling flat on the ground, don't worry. Leave me be. It's just the bifocals and the fact that you're all in different space. (laughs) So we're going to see how it goes. I'm giving him a test run. I made a big investment so that I'm not ripping my glasses up and down every Sunday. We'll see how we go. Let's pray. Father, open your word. Help me to present it clearly. Because, Lord, we want to hear it, and we want to obey it, and we want to live it. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, phone. A New Home, that's the series, second talk in our series on Acts chapter 1 and 2. We're looking at the birth of what we might call the New Testament church in Acts chapter 1 and 2. Last week I titled my talk, The Deal is Done. In other words, there's a new home, but the contract terms for this new home, well, they're Jesus and his gospel, the good news of his life, death and resurrection. And I said, getting the keys is like God's promise that you will get the Holy Spirit. I will pour the Holy Spirit out and he will empower you. But I did say last week that actually church is not the forever home. Yes, we're seeing the disciples enter a new home, but this is not our forever home. In fact, church today is more like a caravan. It's a temporary home. When we look at Acts chapter 1, particularly if you like this second half of the passage of that chapter, we're not actually in the caravan, we're only in the bus stop. You can do two things in a bus stop. You can be homeless and be finding shelter, so you're just getting out of the rain. Or, most commonly, when you're at the bus stop, you're waiting for the bus. Which one are the disciples doing in Acts chapter 1? Well, Jesus promised them that he would send his spirit. On one occasion, Jesus was eating with them, and he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with water the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 9, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They are to wait in Jerusalem before they enter their new spiritual home, their new place of belonging, the church as the Spirit's poured out. So we start our passage in verse 12. The apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And they wait. It's life in the bus stop. What do you do when you're in the bus stop? You wait with expectant hope that the bus is coming. You trust the promises. See, the bus company puts out a timetable. The buses run on a Wednesday. I'm waiting for the bus. You don't play Monopoly. You don't pull out your game of board of Monopoly. You don't start suddenly pulling out all your shoe cleaning stuff and polishing your shoes because the bus might come. Instead, you get ready. Your bags are organised. You're looking down the road You're waiting for the bus. Now today, here at Penno, as believers, we're we're no longer in the bus stop. 
But as I said last week, we are in the caravan of God's house, God's church. In other words, I said last week, it's like grand designs. You know, they build their fantastic forever home. But while they're building the forever home, they're living in the caravan. Because it's not the forever home. And there, there's work to be done and there's a mission and there's a purpose. And in the caravan, things are not entirely comfortable. It's good, there's hope, but not entirely comfortable. What do we do as we wait in the caravan? Well, what I want us to do this morning is learn from those in the bus stop in Acts chapter 1. Because there are, I believe, remarkable similarities. Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem till he sent the Holy Spirit to wait with expectant confidence. They weren't to wait as mindless fanatics or deluded fools. See, these, this community, this small, nascent community, had very good reason to wait with confidence. And I'd like to give you three reasons they had for waiting with confidence. And the first is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Fifty days ago, it was the 2nd of February, and Townsville was in flood. Do you remember that? Not that long ago, was it? I don't know what else was going on in your life, but a flood in Townsville doesn't have a huge impact on most of us here, but we can even remember that news item. It was so recently. Fifty days ago, Jesus rode into Jerusalem seated on a donkey colt. And the people rejoiced and said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the King of Israel. And they threw palm branches and their coats before him. And the disciples were buoyant and full of expectant hope. Here comes our king, 50 days ago. They spent about a week in Jerusalem. Jesus had a supper in an upper room with his disciples and he taught them a lot. I'm going away, I'm leaving you, I'm departing. And they were perhaps confused. Then they went to the garden, the Mount of Olives, where Jesus prayed in anguish. And there he was betrayed by one of the disciples, Judas, and they came and arrested him. And he was put on a mock trial where he was beaten and pilloried and led out through Jerusalem to the place called Golgotha where they crucified him. He died. They took him down. They wrapped him in grave clothes. They put him in a tomb. They sealed the tomb and they put guards in front of the tomb because we were fearful of what might happen with this messianic figure. Peter denies that he even knew Jesus. The disciple Judas, who betrayed him, takes his own life in shame. The rest disperse. Forty days ago, 40 days ago in Australia, there was a debate about whether we should medivac asylum seekers from Manus Island to Australia. Do you remember that? It's just a news item. 40 days ago, not that long ago. 40 days earlier, these people had no hope, no expectancy, no confidence. In fact, we read on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, they were now gathering, but they were scared. And uncertain. And then the unexpected happened. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus rose from the dead. He appeared to many people over 40 days before he ascended into heaven back to the Father. See, what gave these people confidence and hope to wait expectantly? 
Well, Jesus is alive. We've seen him. This is undeniable. The grave's been conquered, so they're no longer despondent and fearful, but hopeful and full of joy and faith. And Jesus says, wait for the Spirit. Of course we'll wait, because we believe the promises of our risen Lord. Second reason to wait is related to the first. It's that they had great confidence in the Scriptures, which for us would be the Old Testament, that what they said was true. So the risen Jesus had taught them. We go back to Luke's Gospel, also written by Luke and Acts, written by the same guy. Jesus said to his disciples, How foolish you are, this is after he'd risen from the dead, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken about. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? This was written about, says Jesus, on walking to the town of Emmaus with these, and beginning with the Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That's that one. He goes for a walk with two disciples who don't recognize him to this town called Emmaus. And he starts talking and they said, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Later on that, he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what was written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Jesus, when he rose, kept pointing his disciples to the scriptures and the fulfillment of the scriptures, showing them everything that's happened that you didn't expect was prophesied, was written about by the prophets. It was all part of God's plan to save his people. So there they are on the bus stop, processing what now? You know, Judas not only betrayed Jesus, but now he is dead. How do we process this? That's for the previous verse. And we read that in those days, back to Acts chapter 1, Peter stood up among the believers, a group of numbering about 120 and said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled, in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. Jump a few verses to verse 22. Peter says, it is written in the book of Psalms. He quotes Psalm 69. May his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. He then quotes Psalm 109 and may another take his place of leadership. So there's a small, small number, 120 people and now 11 disciples, 11 apostles. That 11, these people now form the remnant of a new Israel. Those who come to put their faith in Israel's true Messiah. But there's only 11 of them and there was 12 tribes of Israel. And Jesus chose 12 disciples, 12 apostles. You see, this new house has 12 rooms, symbolically. Who will be the 12th? And quoting Psalm 69 and Psalm 109, both of which are psalms that speak about the king of Israel suffering at the hands of his enemies, but in those psalms, his king would be vindicated and would bring judgment. Peter says, Jesus is that king. Judas is the enemy. His place must be replaced. In fact, Judas's betrayal was a divine imperative. So when the Holy Spirit speaks, when the Scripture speaks that the Holy Spirit will be sent, well, more of that next week, there's great reason to wait with expectancy because the Scriptures will be fulfilled. They had great confidence in the Scriptures. There's a verse I left out. Da, 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 da. Third reason. It actually builds on the resurrection and their confidence in Scripture is they came to realize 
this small group, that the fulfillment of the ages, that God's eternal plan revealed in the prophets had fallen upon them. Small though they be, 11 apostles would soon be 12, 120 people would soon be a countless multitude. They were God's chosen people. They were the new Israel for the new day. And God would pour his Holy Spirit on them and from them out through all the peoples of the world. They were the nucleus of the new home for God's people. And this changed them. Therefore, they waited in Jerusalem with eager expectation, looking forward to the fulfillment, looking forward to the new day that God Jesus promised when the Spirit would come. See, they're at the bus stop and nothing has yet been realised. They don't even know what they're kind of waiting for, what it will look like. But they knew Jesus rose from the dead. They believed the scriptures and they realised that the new day was coming even upon them. So they waited with confidence. Now lots has changed. 120 is now millions, 12 apostles. Well, we've got their writings in the scriptures of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit has been poured out not just on those people, but on all who follow Jesus. There are big differences, but actually there's a lot of common ground with those people waiting because we are in the caravan of church. And the angel said in verse 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. We wait for Jesus' return. We wait for the fulfillment of the ages, for new heavens and a new earth, the home of righteousness. We wait for the day when we will be clothed with him corruptible bodies and in the meantime we live by faith and we trust God's promises Jesus will return see our grounds are no different Jesus is still risen from the dead he is alive Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15 about us if Christ has not been raised, if it's not true, our preaching is futile and so is your faith. Everything hangs on the resurrection. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. There's no point being a Christian if Christ has not been raised. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, only because it makes me feel better now, Oh, Paul says, we are of all people are most to be pitied. How sad to be giving your life to a lie. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, says Paul, who saw the risen Christ. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The resurrection gives us great hope. And we can have confidence in Scripture because so much more of what was promised has been fulfilled than what those disciples knew. We have the New Testament, the New Covenant writings. And for me, this story just fits. It fits life experience. It fits together as a unity. And the more, this is my personal testimony, I've been as pastor now for 17 years, three years of Bible college, so let's call that 20 years of Bible stuff. The more I have taught the Bible and the more I have wrestled with the Bible, the greater my confidence has become. And the bits that I find difficult and hard to understand, and the more I understand and the more I wrestle, the more I believe. That's my opinion. That's my experience. And the fulfillment of the ages, well, we are not apostles. We haven't got that unique place. But we are, Peter says, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's possession that we may declare his praises. The one who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. We are special. We are precious in God's sight. We are loved. We have good reason to wait for Jesus' return. And, therefore, to be transformed. As those in the bus stop 
are transformed. See, there's four ways I'd like to show you that they were transformed. They lived changed lives. Firstly, they were obedient. Jesus said, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. And we read that the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying and they waited. They were obedient. Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem. We will wait in Jerusalem. We don't know how long, but we will wait. Peter encourages them from the scriptures that they must replace Judas and they obey in faith. Secondly, we see them transform now with a unity of purpose. This small band of 120 people are united as one. They're no longer scattered, no longer fearful, no longer denying. They belonged together, the nucleus of the family of God. And so we read, in verse 13, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. That's 11. Squashed into this one room, waiting together. But possibly more than 11. They all joined together constantly at prayer, in prayer along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. Those who were at the foot of the cross, those who saw Jesus' blood flow, who saw him breathe his last, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the disciples, they were in the room, along with Jesus' brothers. And if you read back in the Gospels, you know that Jesus' brothers opposed his ministry. They didn't like their brother going out there and being this figure. And yet here they are, with the new gathering, united together as one. And then they chose one, a new apostle. There was no division. There was no Matthias party or Joseph party. There was no separation between, oh, you're one of the 11 or oh, you're one of the people who's part of Jesus. You're a relative of Jesus or you're just one of the followers. No, they're one. There is unity of purpose because they're living changed lives. Thirdly, there is devotion to prayer. This is particularly how this unity is expressed. They all joined together constantly in prayer. They were bound together in prayer, devoted to prayer. Two men are nominated, Matthias and Joseph, both good candidates. And they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go to where he belongs. They knew God had promised that another one would come. John Stelt says God's promises don't render prayer superfluous. On the contrary, it is only his promises which give us warrant to pray and the confidence that he will hear an answer. Lord, you've promised, help us as we look for a replacement. Finally, they had this incredible confidence that God was at work in their midst, that he was present amongst them, even in the bus stop. You get this odd bit at the end of this passage. I don't know if you picked it when it was being read. We need to replace Judas. We need, there's 12 rooms in this house. We've only got 11 so we're going to use our wisdom. You have to see, there's some criteria. You need to have spent time with Jesus during his life. You need to have seen his resurrection. You need to have heard his teaching. You need to have been part of the crowd. And then they pray, Lord, Lord, you know every heart. Show us which one. And then they take a vote. No. Then they draw lots. Why didn't they toss a coin? That would have been quicker, wouldn't it? Heads, Matthias, you're in. That's literally what happened. But they drew lots. Church business meeting 101. <laughs> Sounds a bit random, doesn't it? 
But I think it expresses a profound confidence that God was present and active amongst them. God is at work even in the small things. We have prayed. We have exercised our wisdom. And I wonder at times if we lose some of that confidence of God's present active involvement in our lives. That he is transcendently present. That he has an active interest in everything. That he is sovereign in power. I wonder if at times we rationalize everything to the point that we actually believe God is not involved. Everything's just cause and effect. And I will pray to this God out there. Everything's cause and effect, but we leave out the prime mover, the great cause, the living God. And so we end up with a God in theory, but not one who's personally involved in practice in the smallest details. Like, for instance, who you might talk to over morning tea, or the incident that happened on your way to church this morning. Or who rings up the phone. Or the address that I find in the bottom of my handbag, and whether I should ring that person now. God is sovereign over every roll of the dice, every phone call, every encounter, and these people in the bus stop believed that, and they waited with expectant hope. How much more should we, upon whom the fulfilment of the ages has come, how much more should we who have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, how much more should we be changed It's the same call, the song, sometimes we sing, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey obedience and faith. And we, the, our theme this year is belong, find your place in the family of God. We are, should be drawn into a unity of purpose and we should express that unity particularly in united prayer. I have been so encouraged over recent months to see how we have united at times in prayer and how God has worked through those prayers. It's never easy, even the outcomes aren't always easy, but we've prayed in faith for Judith. And I believe God's done a great work in her life. We prayed in faith for Jane Lamb for her kidney transplant, and she testified just a few days ago. We prayed in faith for Lewis. We prayed in faith for Josiah, and what a joy it's been to see those two little boys in our midst recently. Will we pray together for kingdom growth? Christianity Explored, they're in the last two weeks, one more week to go. Will you pray that people come to faith in Jesus just down the road? We've got a desire to send people out from our church to, for strategic kingdom growth. We're in conversation with Eastwood Baptist at the moment. Will you pray for that? That God might open up doors for us to send people to good opportunities to see his kingdom grow. Will you keep praying that we'd increasingly be relational in sharing Jesus, not out of formulas necessarily, although they can be helpful, but out of a love for people and our relationships would you pray for Christine on constantly as she returns to Taiwan and her brother Jeff and wife Beth? Will you pray for Natasha? Will you pray for Daniel who's in training at the University of New South Wales? Will we pray together? Will we pray together, come Lord Jesus, we want to go to our eternal home. We want to leave the caravan. Come Lord Jesus. And as we pray, are we confident in God's sovereignty? So in one sense, we have low expectations and everything's a gift. Because God is in control, even over the trials. We're not there yet. These people in the bus stop have a lot to teach us. But my prayer is that as a church family, we might have an increasing sense of belonging around these truths. Jesus is Lord. He's alive. He's given us his word, his precious, precious word. He's transforming us by the power of his spirit. He's calling us into his kingdom work. 
and we get to live with hope as we wait the new heavens and the new earth. Let me pray. Father God, help us to live with expectant hope. Help us to look for Jesus' return. Help us to work for that day that is to come. Help us to, as we sang earlier, help us to live for your kingdom. And Father, by the power of your Spirit, keep changing us into the likeness of our Lord. We ask in his name. Amen.